morning. Welcome back to the Lighthouse Baptist Church. We have all of you with us. All right, uh, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5 again. Uh, we are still on the BEQs that will run over to the end of this month. We are at uh, part 5. We are covering the BEQs. A very short sermon on the Mount by the Lord Himself, but there's a lot of depth, right, for the Christian life. Not just the Christian life, but about who the Christian is. And today we'll be look, we've, we've covered uh, from verses 3 all the way to 9. And we've covered all the beatitudes. And today we'll look at the results of the consequences of being a Christian. Alright, Matthew 5, verse 1 to 16 reads, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they are to the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you, persecute you, and shall say, All men are evil against you, false you for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecute the day the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost his savour, wherewith shall it be salted? Is then for good for nothing but be cast out and be trodden under the foot of men? Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, neither do men by the candle and put it under a bushel or on a candlestick. And give it, and give it light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today once again. We thank you for your word. We ask that you lead us into the truth, teach us, guide us, help us to be the Christians, and not to be for your glory. And just sing for you. All right. So we've come to verse ten. All right. We've come to verse ten. We covered up to verse nine last week. Up to last week, and we are now in verse ten. The last of the beatitudes. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And generally, verse 11 and 12 can be lumped together with verse 10. And all the three of them are talking. Verse 11 and 12 are uh, expounding on verse 10 on, for being persecuted. All right, so we will not cover 11 and 12 in depth in depth. We will be going to solve the earth the next round. But today we will be looking at verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. In other words, our Lord has finished the general portrayal of the characteristics of the Christian man by the end of verse 10. And he then applies this last statement in particular to the disciples. Alright, he says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Here he's talking about all the characteristics of the Christian person. And then here is the consequence. Right, at first glance, this beat may seem different from the rest in that it is not so much a description of a Christian but rather a consequence of being a Christian but yet it is still also a description of the Christian in that the Christian is a persecuted person. To be a true Christian in the world, an unholy, sinful world, you will be a persecuted person. Whether overtly or covertly, you will be persecuted. Whether it's openly persecution, open persecution like you know, churches being burned in other countries, you know, Christians being stoned to death, uh, killed, you know, just because they're Christians. Or overtly in the sense of like maybe subtly in the workplace, among your friend circles, right, among your family members even sometimes. Right? These are differences, but the person, the true Christian in the world is a persecuted person. While the other beatitudes talk about what it means to be a Christian directly, this final one in verse 10 talks about the reality of the consequences of being a true Christian. This is what will happen to you because you are a Christian, it seems to be saying. We also see, interestingly, that the promise in this beatitude is the same as the promise in the first, in verse 3. In verse 3, it reads, Blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The same promise as the one in the first beatitude. Christ began in the first beatitude with the promise of the kingdom of heaven and ends the last beatitude with the promise also of the kingdom of heaven. As if to say and to highlight 
the focus, the importance and the point of this whole sermon that he's just preached is the importance of being part of the kingdom of God. He begins with the kingdom of God and ends with the promise of the kingdom of God. It does not matter what happens in and through your life or how well you live or what good things you have done if you do not first begin and end with seeking first the kingdom of God. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. We should start with the kingdom of God and you end with the kingdom of God. Nothing else will matter if a person were out of the kingdom of God, that is to say, outside of being truly saved. Right. If one is not truly saved, it doesn't matter what you do, how many good things you do, good things, right, uh, it's not going to come to the glory of God, it's not going to come to uh, your life as a child of God. So that brings us to, straight into the lesson in point number one, lesson that they should persecute for righteousness' sake, for they are the kingdom of heaven. Now to cover what being persecuted for righteousness' sake is, we're going to look at what it is not first. What it is not. One major point of importance we must note in this final beatitude is the clause. The clause is for righteousness' sake. It does not merely say, Blessed are they which are persecuted, full stop. Right, there is a clause. You have to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. What is righteousness? Righteousness is not goodness. Blessed are they who are persecuted for doing good. That's not what righteousness is. Righteousness is Christ. You need to be persecuted for Christ's sake, for God's sake. Then you have that blessing. Then it is glorifying God. This is not a pers persecution as a result of one's own mistakes and foolishness. No. <clears throat> if you go out there and make a mistake and you're persecuted for it, you say, Oh, I'm a Christian, I'm being persecuted. Sorry, that's not that what that's not what it's referring to. It is not about the Christian who in their own minds think that they are serving God. You know, when you go out there, you look at social media today, every day, people are posting about, oh, free, free, free Palestine, they're in support of, you know, a certain entity, certain organization, certain country, whatever it is, they are of a certain religion and they oppose, you know, God's people and certain things like that. And it's not about you arguing with them online and winning a debate, and then you have to post something that, you know, like debates their point, and then they are persecuting you, saying, hey, we can't be friends anymore, uh, we don't invite you to our house anymore uh, and, this, and then you're, you feel like you're being persecuted oh of course I post this online and you know I'm trying to support the people of God and then uh, you know my friends are leaving me and I'm persecuted that's not what it means that's not what it means it is not going out there and debating other religions or being holier than thou towards your own fellow brethren right towards others for being religious and legalistic about the Bible and getting persecuted for it. No, that's not what being persecuted for righteousness said is. There are many Christian people who are suffering mild persecution entirely because of their own folly or foolishness. Because of something either in themselves or in what they are doing. But the promise does not apply to such people. It is for righteousness sake. Let us be very clear about that. Right, that's the baseline we need to understand. We can bring endless suffering upon ourselves. We can create difficulties for ourselves which are quite unnecessary because we have some foolish idea of how witnessing and testifying ought to be done or because of some false sense of self-righteousness. I have heard many accounts of how non-Christians had the gospel shoved down their throats and bombarded with almost obligatory invitations to keep coming to church or to receive the law or how that hell is waiting for them so much so that they feel hounded and nauseated. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say that you should not evangelize. But I know, I've heard many accounts of non-believers, friends of friends, so on and so forth, oh, they went church before they don't go back. Why? Or they went church one time and it was like, a, you know, like a normal, like our church kind of, like a how play. Conservative church, and then oh, the pastor was preaching about salvation, and like that, pointing at the guy all the time, you, you know, you're not saved, you're going to hell, and you feel like the gospel is being shut up, you're going either I accept or I'm not welcome here, you know, that kind of thing. Or even if you go to a charismatic church, hey, come, come, keep coming, hey, why you never come for you, hey, why you never do this, hey, why you never come, hey, why, 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 why? And then you feel like, oh, okay, guys, chill, chill, you know. I just visited your church once, I'm interested to know more about Christianity, but, uh, this is like overwhelmingly crazy, you know, like, relax. I'm not saying that's wrong to evangelize, but how we go about it. I remember a story about a girl 
There was a, her father was dying of cancer in the hospital. Right? And uh, this her father, she was a Christian. She used she was going to church. The pastor, uh, the the father was a non-believer. He was one of those Christians who went to church in his early days, you know, got remember uh, he someone shared the gospel with him, but he never wanted to go back because he got angry because of something someone said in the church. And he hates to talk about the Bible, but doesn't want to talk about God. And then the pastor asked the girl, can I go and witness to your father? Can I go and minister to your father? She was like, uh, and he was like, you know, in his dying days, maybe the last one or two weeks. The pastor was saying, you know, uh, there's not much time left. Can I go and talk to your father? Uh, I want to share the gospel with him at least once before he goes. I don't know, I mean, I believe that was motivated out of, you know, a desire to sincerely save the soul, but also maybe a desire to a certain extent, like, as a pastor myself, I feel like okay, I feel obligated to talk some, to someone who is dying about God. So that if they die, and they die in their sins, I am clear of my conscience. But that's a selfish motivation, to be honest. Because it's not, yeah, on one hand I can say it's for that person, but on the other hand it's also to say that, uh, at least I did my part, like, he didn't believe that's his problem. There's two ways to this. It's really, are we doing it out of charity for that person? Or is there a selfish motivation? I mean, I'm not talking about the pastor, I'm talking about myself personally, about ourselves, for us to reflect. Anyway, so what happened was that he asked, Can I visit your father in the hospital? The girl went to ask her father, the father said, No, I don't want to hear about any of these things. You know, he was already half on morphine, half not talking. Probably, you know, have you seen people in cancer dying you know, on morphine, they are high, they, they speak incoherently, they are angry, they throw stuff around, they are in pain, they are discomfort, right? So that was the situation. And the girl said to the pastor, uh, I think he's not really, you know, in the right mind. He, I asked him, he says, no one. He got angry and I don't want to like, anger him. Although she said, I will try to talk to him herself. What happened was, on the day the father was to pass away, but the pastor went down. The pastor went down. Right? And, uh, because the pastor really wanted to try and reach this man for the Lord. Right? Again, I'm not talking about who did anything wrong or right. It's not wrong or right. It's about you know, certain situations. The point here is that he went in, the man just passed away. He couldn't. <coughs> the pastor couldn't meet the man before he passed away. But when he went there, the girl didn't know he was going there. And when she opened the door to come out of the ward, she saw the pastor who was trying to come in. And the father had just passed away and she got really angry. Like I said, don't come. And she never went back to church after that. So, but again, who's right and wrong? I, I, I leave it to God at the end of the day. But the point here, the pastor was, you know, the, the what happened after that was the girl never went back to church. Not only she never went back to church, she, she told her friends all oh, the pastor is like this, like that, like this, like that. And the church is like this, like that. Because of her bad experience. And you know, if you were to say that, yeah, they are being persecuted for righteousness sake. The question is, is it really? Is it really? We have to be careful about how we live and how we evangelize. Of course, we have to preach boldly. But the Bible never tells us to force gospel down someone's throat. The, gospel, the Bible doesn't tell us to win debates so that people will come to church. It's not about winning debates. It's not about forcing someone to win. It is presenting truth as it is, out of the sincerity of the charity in your heart because you're mourning your own sin. Remember the Beatitudes, the flow in the Beatitudes. You mourn the sin in your own life. You see what sin has done to you. And you don't want the same thing for someone else, you're really sincerely concerned for them. But at the same time, in your mind, you know that they have to live by their choices, not yours. Brother, I really care for you and I just want to share what I believe to be true. And this is it. What you do with this, how you move forward from here, is entirely up to you. I really strongly encourage you to come. I'd like to invite you, I'd like to keep inviting you. But I hope you don't get upset. If I do feel like I'm never overstepping my boundaries, let me know. Right. Certain ways, how to present the gospel. Again, the point is, just being persecuted doesn't mean that it's for righteousness sin. Right. If I'm going around saying, hey, you better come to church, I right? know you're going to go to hell, you're going to die, I tell you, I don't know, huh? Then, and then the person gets angry at you and you feel, why are you persecuting me? 
and doing for righteousness sake, yay. That's actually not what it is. Essentially, that's what I'm trying to say. It's not what it is. Don't get me wrong, there is nothing wrong about being zealous and desiring to save souls. The question is, how are we going about it? Being fanatical about our beliefs or overzealous in the way we live our lives as Christians. Think Martha and Mary. Martha was busy, anxious, work focused. She was a busy, anxious, work focused Christian. And that can lead to persecution, but that is not what it is. That is not what is commanded in the Bible. You know, recently at our house, <coughs> there was this I stay in the block. Right? I walked smoking on one day, there was this guy, I don't know, uh, I don't know this guy, but, but this unique hang the pride flag, you know the pride, the LGBT flag, the colorful rainbow flag, on National Day, outside the house. Outside, I'm not even inside. Apparently I thought the police says, oh you can hang outside. Oh, you cannot hang outside, but you can hang inside the house. So they asked, is it outside or inside? Hey, outside. Uh, oh, okay, my brain was Okay, anyway, hang the pride flag there. As a Christian, I can go and take a you know, what, some, maybe like a cross, flag of a cross with some Bible verse blocking people outside my house or so. Right? And then the law comes, hey, you don't go to do this, or some neighbor say, hey, I'm Muslim, and how come you can hang Christians like that? I'm offended, you better take it down, and then I feel like being persecuted. Oh, praise the law. That's not what it is. That's not what the Bible is talking about. That is you finding problems for yourself, okay? <laughs> Sorry to say, but that's a fact. So that's the point here. We have to be careful about what we think is being persecuted for righteousness sake. Also, for righteousness sake does not mean being persecuted for a cause. Just any other cause. Like I say, it's not being persecuted for doing something good or what you think is good. There is a difference between being persecuted for righteousness sake and being persecuted for a cause, even no matter how good that cause may be. These two things can be easily mixed up, but they are very, they are very different. There have been men, some of them very well known, who have suffered and have even been put into prisons and concentration camps for religion. But they have not been suffering for righteousness' sake. We have to be careful about that very distinction. There is always this danger of our developing the martyr spirit. This martyr mindset of I'm going to die for Christ, I'm going to do anything and everything for Christ and die for Christ and I'm going to be praised in heaven. Actually, no. There are some people who seem anxious for martyrdom, they almost seek it. That is not the thing about what our Lord is talking about. The BBQ does not even say, Blessed are they that are persecuted for being good or noble or self sacrificing. Suffering and being persecuted for righteousness sake is not the same as being persecuted for being good or noble or self-sacrificing. The beatitude does not say we are blessed if we suffer for being good or noble. The world, as a matter of fact, the world, as a matter of fact, praises people who suffer for being noble, for self-sacrifice, for self-sacrifices. Right? Soldiers are sent to the front line all the time. If you're in the US, not like Singapore, you know, Singapore, the army soldiers get to sit on an army because they are smelly. Uh, people wait for all storm. Why do soldiers sit there and never give up the seat? In the US, they give up their seats for the soldiers to say, hey, you know, thank you for your service, please take a seat. Uh, thank you for your service, here's a coffee for me, free. From the house, whatever it is, different. They, glory, they glorify noble actions, noble deeds, self sacrificing actions and deeds. These, there are people who have made great sacrifices, those who have given up careers, prospects and wealth, and who sometimes have even sacrificed their lives. And the world has thought of them as great heroes and has praised them. But the world is very opposite of the scripture. The world is very opposite of what the Bible says. There have been many Christians today who are said to be very great Christians by the world simply because they made such Sacrifices, think Mother Teresa, think of, uh, you know, Diana, Princess Diana, she did many good deeds, you know, in Africa, she, had, uh, she was a patron of many causes, good causes, but that is not suffering for righteousness' sake. Right? They were praised, in fact, in the world. But there is a big difference between suffering for righteousness' sake and simply being a normal person. You will find that if you're truly suffering for righteousness' sake, there is no account in which the world will ever praise him. Right? That is what the beatitude says. You will be persecuted. So then what 
it is. What is suffering for righteousness sake? <clears throat> Very simply put, being righteous, practicing righteousness, really means being like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Who's God? When the Bible the BTP says, Blessed are they who that are persecuted for righteousness sake, it's basically saying, Blessed are they which are being like Jesus Christ. Who's God? If you want to be like Jesus Christ, you are going to be persecuted. Yes, Jesus was not crucified for his noble deeds or his good deeds. He says, for healing a man and all things we, we stole you not, but for claiming to be the Son of God. Remember, the Pharisees didn't want to kill him because he was doing good deeds, or that he was a good person, or he, that he did many noble things. It's not what they were crucifying him for. They were crucifying him for claiming to be the Son of God. Alright. Therefore, they are blessed who are persecuted for being like Christ. What is more, those who are like him always will be persecuted. Jesus, our Lord himself, teaches this. Let's turn to John 15, 18 to 20. The Lord himself teaches this. If you are like me, you're going to be persecuted. You're not going to be loved in any sphere or any circle if you want to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? I don't mean, I'm not talking about his actions. I'm talking about being holy like him, righteous, uh, pressing towards his mark. It is in opposite of what the world idea of uh, what you should be doing. John 15, if the world hate you, he know that he hated me before he hated you. If he were of the world, the world would love his own. But because he are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept me saying, kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Yes, Paul says to Timothy, who was discouraged by being persecuted, reminding him that all who follow Christ was suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3.12. It says, Yeah, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The word there is shall, means will, not maybe, not sometimes, but shall. All who live godly in Jesus, in Christ Jesus, shall suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3.12. It is a categorical statement. It is a statement Describing the category of people that live for Christ. If you fall in that category, you are going to be persecuted. That is part of the package. It is a statement that encompasses all who truly follow the Lord. Question is, are you being persecuted for how much you are living for Christ? So you say, huh, what are you talking about? I'm, like, I'm not really persecuted in my life. Then are you trying to say I'm not living for Christ? That's not what I'm saying. That's what the Bible is saying. I know a lady who experiences that. You know, and folks, she's, she works in a normal job outside. And her bosses ask her, you know, every year you have your, your goals, right? You sit down with your manager. Okay, what's your next year's plan? What's your, let's review the past year, talk about the next year. Where do you see yourself next year? What do you think you're doing? Uh, how much more you need to impress? Uh, your, your standard of your work, your KPI, so on and so forth. And she was asked this by the manager, what is your goal at work? And her reply was something along the lines of, oh, I just want to earn a living and be able to go home. Right? My salary just means the growing inflation rate. I'm not very ambitious. I don't need to climb the corporate ladder. I, I just want to work and go home. Essentially, I want to... When she says go home, of course, a lady man go home to be a wife, go home to be a mother. Go home to fulfill the God-given roles in the family. She's not pursuing pro career progression. She wants to be able to support the family. Of course, she works because, the, you know, in our present day, the finances are such that two parties need to work. But her goal is not so much to climb the corporate ladder, but to go home and be a wife, be a mother, fulfill the God-given roles. And you know what the response from the boss was? The boss said. Oh, you are not ambitious enough. It will not fly. It's not acceptable. You need to be more ambitious than that. How can you just say that I'm happy to you know, do a entry job level all the time until you retire and then just stay like that? Just take your increment every year like that. You happy like that? You, know, you must press more, you must 
have higher goals. In that sense, to some sense, she's persecuted. Just because she wants to do what God wants her to do. But she's pressing towards the mark of Christ, fulfilling her God-given roles as a helping to her husband, as a mother to a child, and she's been persecuted to some extent. Of course, she was discouraged. She felt unappreciated and even mocked to some extent. But that's a, that is what it means, essentially. Just because you want to be what God wants to be, and you're persecuted for it. That is what it means to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. The world won't understand you because you will be behaving so differently from them in your pursuit of Christ and His righteousness that you will be persecuted. You will be so different from the world that you will be persecuted. Are you being persecuted today? Well, that is the teaching. That is the teaching. We find examples of this throughout the Bible. Abel was persecuted by his brother Cain. Moses received grievous persecution from Egyptians and his own people even. <clears throat> Look at the way in which David was persecuted by Saul and at the terrible persecution that Elijah and Jeremiah endured. Do you remember the story of Daniel and how he was persecuted? Daniel, you know, all these people were not loud people. All these people were not people who went out there to debate and fight and argue and say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a believer in Jehovah God and all of you are going to die. And all. It wasn't that kind of thing. All these people mentioned here were just quietly trying to live their lives the way God wanted them to live. Fulfill the sacrifices, this Old Testament, right? Old Testament people. Daniel couldn't do the sacrifices because he was in Babylon, but he was to pray three times a day facing Jerusalem because that is what Solomon said. Any man who faced the temple and prayed, answer their prayer, right? And so they, Daniel did that. He did he tried to live that life as best he could in his private quarters. And yet, people were persecuting him just because he wanted to be like Christ. Just for pressing towards the mark of God in his life. Quietly, not trying to make a big ruckus or drama, but drama came to him. Drama came to him. Daniel. They were persecuted not because they were difficult or overzealous, but simply because they were trying to live righteously. They tried to live as quietly in pursuit of God as possible, but somehow their lives were always made dramatic by the people around them and persecuting them simply because they desired to live as God wanted them to live. In the New Testament, we find exactly the same thing. Think about the apostles and the persecution they had to endure. Of course, the supreme example is the Lord Himself. Jesus went about preaching the truth of God, of course not in an overbearing, overzealous manner, any time that they were trying to rush to him and make him king, he slipped out among the crowd, you know, said, I, I, I'm not here to be king, I'm here to die on the cross, right? He slipped out among the crowd. He was never one to make any drama, but he was always persecuted. Drama always found him. Here he is in all his other absolute perfection and his gentleness and meekness, right? But remember, Jesus Christ, our God-man, was a very meek person. Right. Of whom it can be said that a bruised reed shall he not break, and a smoking flax shall he not quench. Never was anyone so gentle and so kind in the world. But look at what happened to him and what the world did to him. And by whom are the righteous persecuted? So we covered what it is not, what being persecuted for righteousness is not. We have seen what it means, it means to be persecuted just for wanting to be like Christ, living like Christ. And who are the ones doing this persecution? Who are the ones persecuting those who try to live like Christ? By whom are the righteous persecuted? You will find as you go through the scriptures and as you study the history of the church that the persecution is not confined to the world. The persecution is not confined to the world. Some of the most grievous persecution has been suffered by the righteous at the hands of the church herself and at the hands of religious people. It has often come from normal Christians, persecuting other Christians. Take our Lord himself. Who were his chief persecutors? His own people, the scribes and Pharisees, and the doctors of the law, the ones who claim to know the word of God, the experts in the word of God, were the one persecuting Jesus Christ. Persecution may not come just from outside, but very often and very sadly also from within. 
Even today, I know of pastors who are persecuted for trying to make a stand against unscriptural practices that are creeping into the churches. You know, the church wants a certain thing done, they want to change a certain way they are worshipping, change a certain, you know, instruments in the church for music. The pastors resistant say, oh, you are old school. Time to retire. Time to step down. We need a new generation, we need new blood. You know, I've had people come up to me and tell me, you know, we have a lot of youth in our church. I'm not talking about any particular church in general, but we have a lot of youth in our church. They are very talented musically. We must let them express their musical talent. If we don't let them express here, they will go into another church. You know, they, the person named a few charismatic churches. I'm not going to do that. But, but so we must let them express here. So we must be a bit more open minded. No. no, that's not the way. Persecution can come from within. Some of you may have your own experiences yourself of being persecuted by fellow brethren for trying to do the right thing by law. Legalistic Christianity is often the greatest enemy of the pure faith. So persecution not just from outside, but within. Why? Why are the righteous persecuted? Why are the good and noble often praised? As I mentioned, the good and noble people in the world are praised. But the righteous are persecuted. The answer is quite simple. The good and the noble are examples of the best of what humanity has to offer. I repeat that statement. Huh? The good and the noble in the world are the best of what humanity has to offer. Society and the world often praise these individuals and raise them to the limelight because it glorifies the natural man. It gives them a kind of hope, saying like, if I try hard enough, I think I can achieve this also. It is a works-based motivation for praise. Oh, look at the astronaut. Oh, one day, son, you can be an astronaut. If you work hard enough, you can be like that. You look at Mother Teresa, you can be like that too. You just have to be kind enough, have enough love in your heart, care for people enough, you'll be, you'll be able to do that also. Or look at Gandhi, or look at whatever, other, whoever motivational, inspirational, noble man in the world. <coughs> wow. A person sacrificed himself to save his son, save his children in the world. Amazing. And that is the world's way. And that's why they praise noble and good self-sacrificing deeds. But, and that is where we get it all wrong. That is where we get it all wrong. And that is why the good and noble are praised while the righteous are persecuted. The righteous are persecuted because they are different. We don't just praise good deeds. We praise deeds done for Christ. Done for Christ. That is why the Pharisees and the scribes hated the Lord. It was not because he was good or what he did noble deeds that he was being crucified. It was because he was different. He was being crucified because he was different. There was something about him that condemned them, condemned the scribes and Pharisees. The way that Jesus lived, the scribes and Pharisees felt condemned. They felt guilty about themselves. And they didn't like it. They didn't like it. They knew that this man who claims he is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, I can't find any fault in him. They knew within themselves that I could never be this guy. And therefore they didn't like it. They didn't like the idea that I cannot be this guy. Not on my own. And they crucified him for that. <clears throat> they felt all their righteousness was being made to look like filthy rags. That was what they disliked. That is what they disliked. The world will say it's okay to be Christian, but to be like Christ, that's going too far. No one should pretend or even try to be like God. And that's not true. The Bible says, stress over the mark. For the Christ, the high point of God in Christ Jesus, you have to press towards the mark of Christ. And the world hates anyone who tries to do that. That was the explanation of Daniel's persecution. He suffered all he did because he was righteous. He did not make a show of it. He did it in quietly in his own way. But he said, this man condemns us by what he's doing. We have to catch him. You cannot let him pretend to be all this righteous thing and pray to God. No, no, no. Let him catch him. That is not 
That is always the trouble. And that was the explanation in the case of our Lord Himself. The Pharisees and others hated Him just because of His utter absolute holiness and righteousness and truth. They hated the way Jesus lived because He spoiled the market, made them look bad, and they hated Him for it, persecuted Him. Persecuted Him for it. And that is why the righteous are persecuted. And by way of summary, <coughs> The Bible says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It tells us a lot about the person of Christ. He is not like the world. Sin and the world are in opposition to Christ and to God, and the Lord will never, ever be applauded by the world. Jesus did many good and noble deeds, but Jesus was not applauded by the world. He was hated, and he was hated not because of his good and noble deeds, but just for being who he is and claiming to be who he is. The effect of Jesus Christ upon his contemporaries, the people around him that is, was that many threw stones at him. They hated him and finally choosing a murderer, Bar Barjas, instead of him, they put Christ to death. That is the effect Jesus Christ always has upon the world. We must realize this. If you are truly Christian, you will not fit in in the world. You will not fit in in the world. We will look at this more next week in uh, talking about being the salt of the earth. But the point here is that if you are truly Christian, truly pressing towards the mark of Christ, more often than not, you will find that you will be a persecuted person. But you see, there are other ideas about Christ. There are worldly people who tell us that they admire Jesus. You know, there are people who are not saying that, yeah, I think Jesus is a great man, he's a good man of faith. You know, but that is because they don't really know him. If they knew him and they saw him, they would hate him just as the Pharisees and the scribes did. He does not change. God does not change. Man, sin in man does not change. We are, the, the fallen man is to <clears throat> follow the primitive that will not change. Unless he saved that is of course. So let us be careful that our ideas about Christ are much are such that the natural man cannot easily admire or applaud him. The natural man will not easily admire or applaud Jesus Christ. In fact, they will be skeptical about him. The Bible tells us in 1 John 4, 2 and 15, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. 1 John 4, 2, and then we go on to verse 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Only a truly saved person can acknowledge that Jesus Christ is God, and proclaim that, and acknowledge that, and accept that, and receive him into his life. Only the truly born again will be able to confess with conviction that Jesus Christ is God who came down and took on human flesh. Not just some good man, not some religious leader, not just a person who is to be commended for his good and noble deeds. The world may applaud the man Jesus Christ for his noble deeds, but they will just as readily stone him to death for claiming that he is God. Only the truly born again can claim that he is God. And that is why many will thank the Christian for good deeds they do. In your life as a Christian, when you do good things, nice things for your friends, your family, your neighbors who are lost, they will thank you. Oh, thank you, very nice. Wow, thank you for bringing cake to my house. Thank you for you know helping me look after my dog when I go overseas. Thank you for helping me water my plants. Thank you for all the nice and good things you do as a Christian. But the moment you try and start to preach the gospel, say, oh no, thank God, thank Jesus, He changed my life. And they're like, oh, okay, okay, thanks. Uh -huh. They start to close their door. They start to say, okay, uh, yeah, actually I do this. Uh, actually, I'm something else. Actually, I'm, I believe in another God, whatever it is. They will thank you and you know, invite you to your home for all the good things and nice things you are doing for them. But the moment you try to talk about Christ, you are not interested. And that is the reality of Jesus Christ on the world. And that will be the reality of the truly Christian in the world because your life will reflect Christ in you. So, they often begin to lose interest and walk the other way, often eventually persecuting the true Christian. 
you know, they will talk with the other people, oh yeah, that guy is very nice, yeah. they will just help out, but then every time talk about Jesus, uh, like never respect my religion, uh, they will persecute you for being who you are supposed to be. This leads to the last deduction, which is that the new birth is an absolutely necessary before anybody can become a Christian. You must be born again to be a Christian. To be Christian, ultimately, is to be like Christ. That is the goal of Christian, to press towards the mark. And one can never be like Christ without being entirely changed. We must get rid of the old nature that hates Christ and hates righteousness. We need a new nature that will love these things and love Christ and thus become like Him. If you try to imitate the deeds of Christ, if you just try to imitate the good deeds of Christ, the noble deeds of Christ, the world will praise you. But if you become Christ-like, the world will start to hate you and persecute you. So by way of application, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for just the kingdom of heaven. Finally, let us ask ourselves this question. Do we truly know what it is to be persecuted for righteousness' sake? Not for the things that we do ourselves, not for the mistakes we're making as Christians, but are you truly being persecuted for righteousness' sake? To become like Christ, we have to become light. And light always exposes darkness. And the darkness, therefore, always hates the light. We are not to be offensive, we are not to be foolish, we are not to be unwise. We are not even to parade the Christian faith. We are not to go out there and use a loud hailer and shout and scream. No, that's not the way. We are not to do anything that calls for persecution. But by just being like Christ, persecution will become inevitable. But that is a blessed thing. Rejoice, the Bible says, says the Lord himself, Blessed are ye, happy are ye, if ye are like that. Because if ever you find yourself persecuted for Christ and for righteousness' sake, you have, in a sense, got the final proof of the fact that you are truly Christian, you are truly saved, that you are truly living the life that God wants you to live. Then you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Unto you, says Paul to the Philippians, unto you, it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him but also to suffer for his sake. Philippians 129. 